Hello, everyone. Welcome to day 270 of Humanity Rising. I'm Jim Garrison. I want to welcome all of you. In our last session, uh, we told the story of the magic and mystery of Chartres. And I wanted to bring that in to Humanity Rising today as we begin our new week. Uh, we talked about antiquity and how 3,500 years ago, the Celts and their spiritual leaders, the Druids, swept into Western Europe and discovered the hill of Chartres, uh, 45 miles west of Paris. And the tonality that they discerned was that of a virginal woman expecting impregnation. And they held that energetic for 1,500 years until they were conquered by Julius Caesar. Then the Christians came into that area, and the discernment that they brought in was that the virgin had had a child, and that child was the Messiah. And that tonality of the feminine so deeply embedded in Chartres uh, has uh, been developed uh, for over 2,000 years now. And uh, I was speaking about that. And then after the session, we went into uh, the after uh, chat. And uh, Shannon, who's one of the conveners of, of uh, the after chat, uh, made a comment that I found arresting. And I just wanted to bring it into our uh, deliberations today. She says, now we need to all realize that it's not one child. All of us are the child of the prophecies. All of us are the children that we've been waiting for. And I thought that was just a beautiful way of coming into our age and understanding that whatever it is that we're challenged by, whatever it is that we endure, in some deep and mysterious way, all of us, each and every one of us, are who history has been waiting for. And in that spirit, humanity rising uh, has been convened. So welcome, everyone. And let us begin, as we always do, by just taking a moment centering yourself in your body, tuning yourself to your heart. Just take a moment and close your eyes and see if you can listen to your heartbeat in a spirit of gratitude and deep thanksgiving that you're alive, that all of us, children, are alive at this most extraordinary moment in the human journey. So we have a lot of Thank you, everyone. Now with an open heart and a heart full of gratitude for each and every one of you who are joining our session today, uh, I want to commence our program with a reflection on the state of education. Probably no sector in human society is quite as ancient and quite as obsolete <laughs> as education is in today's world. Uh, people since time immemorial have 
provided learning for the emerging generation and passed down the wisdom and the knowledge of the ancestors to the new generation. And somehow thousands of years ago, this process got codified and I would say ossified around little children coming into classrooms and sitting behind desks and receiving the information from the authoritarian teacher, memorizing that information, having tests, and depending on the way that they could regurgitate memorized information, they either did well or they failed. And of course, the classic example of this is Chinese education, dating back all the way to the Han Dynasty uh, 2,000 years ago, and the great examination halls that were erected for people all across China to come and be examined for days. Uh, and similarly, uh, in the West, uh, the origin of the uh, universities was all around testing. And that led to a rigid way of imparting information. There were, of course, major exceptions to this uh, in antiquity, even as there are uh, today. Uh, but by and large, education has been a stultifying process. So the process of regenerating education, of bringing a whole new way of thinking about education, uh, it in some ways is the most important task of our time because this emerging generation is ground zero for all the things that we have left undone. And so it's, it's essential uh, that we engage in the reinvention of education. That's why Ubiquity University was founded to reinvent education at a time of global crisis or nothing less than a new consciousness, as Einstein said, will suffice to deliver us from the problems that we've created by a consciousness that has led us to the brink of destruction. Uh, that's why over the last uh, several months, uh, Ubiquity University has been reinventing the MBA into a master's in regenerative action, because we believe that given the urgency of the crisis that is besetting us at the center of which is runaway climate change. Uh, it's no longer possible to be sustainable with an environment that's completely broken. We have to regenerate human society and regenerate uh, the larger ecosystem. So that's gonna be our theme today is how do we engage, how do we think about Education is an act of regeneration, as, a, as an act of revitalization, a re-quickening of the human spirit in the radical root of that word from the Latin educare, which means to lead forth, to bring forth uh, the genius uh, within. And to uh, uh, contemplate these matters, we have two scholars, uh, two professors. Um, one, uh, Professor uh, Kenneth Gergen, uh, who is a, a research professor at Swarthmore College. He's also the president of uh, Teos um, uh, Institute. Uh, he's internationally known for his work in uh, education. Uh, he's written uh, a number of books on uh, called Realities and Relationships, The Saturated Self, uh, and Relational Being. Uh, and he lectures widely uh, globally. Uh, he's going to be joined uh, by Professor Chateau Gill, uh, who's an associate professor at the University of Sussex, uh, who's the director of the UNESCO uh, initiative on uh, uh, transformational education and collective healing. Uh, she also has written a number of books, Happiness, uh, Flourishing, and the Good Life, 
uh, uh, ethical education uh, and education as uh, humanitarianism. And both of them together have co-authored, I think, one of the most important books, and that is uh, Beyond the Tyranny of Testing. There's probably no tyranny in the world today <laughs> that is more severe than the tyranny that we subject our own children to and force them to memorize information for testing. So Sherto and Kenneth came together and wrote a seminal book uh, on this uh, uh, great dysfunction uh, in uh, modern education. So Kenneth, uh, Sherto, uh, welcome to Humanity Rising. Uh, and thank you for all the books that you've written and the work that you're doing in this most important area, area of regenerating education in our time. Uh, so welcome, and I turn the program over to you. Yeah, well, thank you so much, Jim. That's a very generous introduction and very much appreciated. I also um, want to say how much I appreciate what you've been doing these last almost a year with these daily contributions, inspiring contributions, especially during the time of COVID. I found them extremely important. It was like a Thank you. Of fresh air coming in. And um, I, it's just like that you're doing this. I congratulate you and your colleagues. It's uh, really a quite wonderful. And also what you're trying to do with education. And perhaps we can come back with that later on because I think we're very much aligned in many ways. Definitely. Um, in that sense, I also send my greetings from the Taos Institute because we are very similar in one sense in that we're trying to sort of co-create resources or dialogic and collaborative means towards what we hope are better ends in the future for humanity. I also appreciate very much uh, your little figuration at the beginning about we're all children fresh and now learning, because I think we're not only talking about school children here, we're talking about we who should be the knowers or the teachers, that we too are the children. And that what we've inherited from the past while valuable, it needs that kind of regeneration. And that's indeed what we wanna talk about today. <clears throat> Chateau, perhaps you should introduce further what we're going to do. Yeah, thank you, Jim, um, um, for um, such a generous introduction. And hello, everyone. Uh, like Ken said, every day I sit behind the um, the uh, the HR's room as yourself, join the audience in appreciating what Jim offers uh, daily and is such uh, rich and the enriching experience. And um, over time, I must say, I get to know the audience a little bit. Some of the names in the chat became familiar. So I look forward to interacting with you today. Um, um, so apart from a heartfelt thank you to all of you, um, today we want to look at um, relational pathways towards generative education. But it's just a couple of words about why we came together. So Ken and I have been together uh, working together for some years. And uh, the first, our collaboration, you can see, has carried the challenge of a multiple differences, gender, age, personal background, locations. I'm in Europe and Ken is in the US and the intellectual history, scholarly interest um, and institutional settings and more. So transcending these differences involves a practice uh, of dialogue and the relational ethic, which we'll touch upon later. But in doing so, so I'm, we are, and I am more convinced than ever, the relational orientation does offer a site for deep encounter, for genuine meeting in the Martin Buddha sense for regeneration. The second point I want to highlight is we could have worked on many different topics of mutual interest, such as I work for a peace institute, positive peace, global ethics, collaborative governance, and so on. But we have chosen our collaboration on education because we both believe that education holds the true hope, like Jim had just said, for humanity's future. It pertains to that beautiful promise of that which 
it's still to come. So, um, Ken, I'll just give an outline of what we're going to do today. So in the next hour or so, we don't really know the time, but um, we can we just look at each other to check the time. We're going to do probably a couple of things, maybe more. We'll start with um, regeneration and to share with the audience here why we believe it is important or it's even an imperative for education to be a site for regeneration. And that we could consider relational practice as pathways towards it and why it is important. We then could look at um, structure obstacles to overcome in order to embrace a relational ethic in education. And finally, if we have time, Ken, perhaps we could uh, return to the regenerative vision and that's ubiquity and also people in this community are so enthusiastic about and investigate opportunities and potentialities afforded by our present time for a better future. So, Ken, perhaps you could open up the conversation. Um, yeah, I, in some way, Jim has already done that, but let me try to underscore a little bit of what we're dealing with and the problems that we have on our hands because I think, and we're talking mainly about public education here, although the implications are far broader than public education, as you'll find out. But in these terms, what we largely inherit over large parts of the world is kind of a, a vision of production where we, where we have schools, kind of areas in which we take the raw material, children who don't know anything, and we try to shape them we give them knowledge, give them resources and so on, so that we produce them in order to take on roles in society. Now, this presumes a lot. <laughs> one, that they are raw material. One, that we, we can shape them uh, and are. And secondly, that we know what society is becoming. And this is sort of the beginning point, because at this point, we know very little about what the future holds that we realize that history and the issues right now are continuously changing very rapidly, highly complex, uh, unpredictable conditions, and, this, and global implications for any local event. And under those conditions, simply knowing a fixed body of knowledge, which might have been important some decades before, just isn't the way to go. That we cannot simply offer and stamp in a fixed curriculum in an uncertain future, that we somehow need people who are flexible, creative, engaged, and able to work with each other. And if you look at what we have in those terms, it's not only the curriculum, it's the whole standardization process in which we want everybody to measure up to a certain standard, when in fact, <laughs> That standardization is, is working in the, in the reverse direction from what we ought to be doing, which is creating a, a rich body of potentials, not simply people who know a certain thing and can do a certain thing, but who can do many, many things and who can master them and, and co-create as the, as the world moves on. And I want to also emphasize, and it will become even, this emphasis will even become greater as we move, this potential to collaborate. The system now tends to work on individuals. So it's individuals who learn, individuals we cherish, individuals we measure, where we need people who can work together because no one can solve these problems that we have. They are going to require us to be able to listen to each other, to be able to absorb, to synthesize, to co-create something else and to be able to listen sympathetically to those who differ. And none of that is prepared in the current educational system. So these are some of our issues. Um, there are more, but at least it will underscore some of the problems that we feel we have and where we must go to regenerate. So, Shoto, let me turn it back to you then. Um, thank you. Um, but what you have sketched here can really cause into question the, um, the suitability of modern public education system, you call it, it's almost like a factory system, for that shared future that we're anticipating. Well, like what you already pointed out, education today can be summarized almost like um, 
a system of transmission or production strengthened by, you already mentioned, um, mechanisms of control, standardization and classification, reward and the punishment uh, and, and, and credits and penalties and the, all, all these and supported the measurement apparatus, um, which we'll probably talk about later, testing, grading, cost-effective analysis. I mentioned this because these are all pushing education into the realm of economics. It's not just knowledge, the body that even that body knowledge you mentioned, we are buying and selling and marketizing and commodifying, but it's also human beings, ourselves, together with like to give, um, uh, Jim at the, at the beginning talk about our gifts and talents, our work, our time that's being instrumentalized and treated as tradable goods. This is dehumanization is its best really. So what missed out is therefore the meaningfulness of education, learning of well-being of children and young people, teachers in the here and now. So no wonder you see mental health. Um, um, well, there's an organization called Mental Health Europe that suggests there is a hidden pandemic of ill-being amongst the children and young people today, those ones in education. So, so having said that, we may even say that um, there have been many attempts to develop those kind of um, qualities you mentioned earlier. Well, these were put into the alternative camps. Now, let's just mention a few. I may mention four or five. For instance, the worldwide democratic school movement are the example being influenced by Dewey, Holt, and A.S. Neal. Democratic education seeks to encourage individuals self-motivated learning and, and that would direct their attention to whatever interests them in their life. But at the same time, situating these interests within a community of common concern. And that is why there is actively living out our citizenship with a democratic learning environment. But you might, we might also mention this, the critical movement. Can you know very, yourself know very well? And inspired by philosophers such as Paulo Freire, Bell Hooks or Patty Lather and so on, critical pedagogy engage the context, cultural processes, history, values and meaning that students are both exposed to, but also bring into the, the classroom. And in doing so, encourage students to actually challenge the underlying or accepted so-called social truth pervaded by other media or other forms of transmission. And um, so in a sense, the critical approach focuses on transforming the power relations in, in classroom, in education, as the basis for conscious consciousness raising and social action. And uh, there are other movements such as child centers movement, or holistic education and so on. So these are all probably can be put at, as, as a, a large umbrella that these all include an implicit recognition of the integral wholeness of our being with all that is in the larger ecosystem. And, and, and this particular point is very much at the core of the concern of humanity rising. Now, human, well, child-centered holistic or holistic education is a simultaneously physical, social, emotional, ethical, and spiritual, and that deeply rooted in appreciation of ourselves as part of the greater whole. And um, to mention a few indigenous education or um, traditional African approach to education, but also those established movements such as Montessori, Rudolf Steiner, Christian Murthy schools and so on. These are other examples. I may also mention our own work, which we call it human-centered education that respects the intrinsic value of the whole person and our holistic well-being and regards learning and well learning as cultivating and unfolding those qualities central to living meaningfully and well with each other and, and with all the other beings on the planet. So we can think about those qualities, which Ken, you already mentioned, to be nurtured at awareness of self as spiritual beings, listening, curiosity about each other, caring for things that truly matter beyond ourselves, there's also, you talk about compassion 
and responsibility. So human-centered education is essentially facilitating the blossoming, the flowering, all aspects of our life together through learning. Now, the point is a long-winded point. That is the reason I want to mention these alternatives is because, is because these alternatives to mainstream public education system, although the kind of directed was very subtly and differentiated aims and, 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 and favor kind of a very diverse structural features and a pedagogical approach. But Ken, I think you would agree that their particularities are somehow united by a common relational vision, which is an acknowledgement that whether it's a democracy or social action, social transformation, individual freedom, personal empowerment, human well being cannot be advanced within an antagonistic and mutually alienating system. And instead, for education to truly be directed those greater ends, it must be a site for relational regeneration. So uh, Ken, as you have written so much about relational being and relational theory, I wonder if you would like to uh, comment on this. Yeah, well, let me take this in a special direction because I think there's a tendency here very much to fold the idea of relationships into a view of individuals who come together to form a relationship. That's generally what we mean by it, that somehow the individuals are the basic atoms of society and one or more individuals come together, we form some kind of relationship so that if in that sense, if we made education more relational, it would be about fostering those kinds of individual relationships. But I, the view here is quite different, and it's it's difficult to get one's head around it in a way, which is to try to shift the center of gravity from the individuals to the process out of which the individuals come. Now, why do that? <clears throat> well, one has to realize, first of all, if you take that individual position so that we, that we are the fundamental atoms of society, what you have is already a kind of an ontology of separation. Uh, you there, me here, each of us in our boxes on the screen. Um, fundamental separation. So that the, then the question is, how can we relate? How should we relate? Or should we have relations in the first place? What would they, what will we get from them? Because when we begin with a sort of fundamental separation of them, of self and other. My primary obligation in some sense is to take care of myself, to be careful of what I'm doing, to be sure that I develop, um, to be sure that I am well taken care of. And secondarily, I should help you, secondarily, because my first is self-responsibility to my own being. And what does that mean? I have to worry about my esteem. Am I all right? Am I, am I okay? And what do I do? I compare with other people to make sure that I'm okay and I'm getting my share, um, that I'm not blemished, that I'm not underneath, that I'm not oppressed, and so on. Watching out over my own good. And indeed, democracy tends to be based on that idea. Each person being the origin of their own ideas, their own, their own destiny in a sense. So here I am and relations then become secondary. Why should I have one? Perhaps I should only have one if I need it for something, which is a totally instrumental view. Yes, I'll have a relationship, but what do I get out of it? What are the costs and benefits of my having a relationship? Which is in a sense a totally instrumental view of self and other. So we've got these issues with that whole individualist sort of background. It's not compensated by having a communal background either where we're all together as one, because then what we do is simply replicate the problem of the individual with taking care of the community or the one as opposed to other ones. So what about the possibility of then shifting, as I said, the emphasis away from the individuals into the process out of which they become? 
Now, as I said, that's a little hard to grasp at times. But take a take. Let's look at it this way. What if um, I'm talking here now? I have all these words that I'm using. I didn't make up those words, not a single one. Not one of those words came out of my imagination, my intuition, my thinking, or whatever. Nor did they from anyone else. Because a word isn't a word in a meaningful way unless there's some agreement, unless we are coordinated to use that utterance in a certain way, at a certain time, under certain conditions. That is, it is that relational process, that coordination among us, out of which language emerges, out of which my ability to say anything emerges, which is to say, to reason with you. I have no ability to reason with you outside of a whole tradition of coordination of which I am now a part, speaking right now, simply moving within that tradition, now sharing it at this moment, with you and here it will make no sense unless you do something with it unless you take it in in certain ways and some of you will take it in in ways that uh, will be useful others of you will question it others of you may find it absurd and i don't have any control over that in effect for me to be an intelligent person requires you to be with me and for you to make that judgment requires me to have said these things. So that we are at every moment co-creating in our coordinations or lack of them. That it's the coordinations out of which we become. And think of the gestures now here too. Where did that gesture come from? I didn't make that up. That too gets its meaning, like the words we speak out of previous coordinations. You might call them dialogic if you wish, some do, but it required us to make that meaningful. It required us to make my clothing meaningful. It required us to make, in fact, what I care about in life, to make goals interesting, to make things valuable, to have any concern, con right now or ultimate that didn't just come out of the air we we co-created that possibility we and i mean here not you and me i mean the co-creative process gave us these possibilities now what would that mean for example practically it means in some way i cannot i cannot be a person who shares or does good in the world, or can be loving, or can be compassionate, alone. None of those are acts in themselves. They only become acts of compassion, of sharing of good or loving, by virtue of how you coordinate with them. So in order to me to give a gift, it would be a generous gift. You have got to treat it that way. You have got to define it that way. Otherwise, I'm not generous. I may be oppressive with that. It may be a way of soliciting something. Uh, it may be uh, just an offhand. I didn't mean to. In, a, in effect, I cannot be generous. I cannot be compassionate without you that allows me to be that. So the question is, in some sense, what is it that education fosters in the way of that kind of relational well-being, the relation, the process of, of the relation, the well-being of that process? How can we give that process our major concern? What would that look like in education? Where is it now beginning to emerge? Because there are some practices that indeed help us in that direction, that move in that direction. They exist already, if we can only begin to give them support, give them nurturance, help them into being. And Pat Chertel, maybe you could pick it up there. That would be a really interesting to see where you go with that. Yes, it's quite, um, in some ways, it's, it's quite simple in terms of the coordinating um, 
the, the notion of coordination in, in the relational process. At the same time, it's quite difficult to imagine um, why the DE emphasis are, is laid on um, um, the, the individual unit and why is it important to lay the focus on the relational process. Um, so maybe I will go through some examples to illustrate, but in the meantime, I just want to uh, highlight what you may, you uh, actually, what you said implied uh, a, a wonderful distinction. Can you, almost like you're suggesting that within the relational flow, there are some activities, some processes, some movements, some gestures that can contribute generatively or regeneratively to the relational process itself and to the well-being of those involved, of the participants. And many forms of, you mentioned a dialogue, collaboration, and, and, and just like a dance, the, the more you dance, the, the more the, the rigor that you put into the dance, the, the, the more beautiful the dance it is. Um, but you, what's implied, I think, is that there are active activities and processes that can result in degenerative relationships and even ill-being. So we may come back to that at some point. Now, as to your question, what does a relational ethic look like in education? Uh, and and um, so um, perhaps um, it's, well, it's difficult to, um, um, to summarize it in bullet point. So I'm just wondering if I would use a story of a school that I was involved for 20 years as, as a form of illustration. So, um, because what you said is quite abstract, so let's use the example. In 1999, a group of local parents in southeast of England decided to create a primary school for children aged from three to 12. Um, that has a relational ethic as its foundation. So clearly it's intended to be a community where the relational process are val valued. And um, in terms of practice, this is translated. The first of all, everybody is addressed by their first name rather than a miss or mister. And because um, um, in this community, if it's a community, our connections, our relationship, our interconnection should not be defined by roles. So we don't see each person as a role occupant, but when here we all participate in, in, in a process of equals. So that's a starting point. Secondly, as a, a learning community, so learning is not limited to children, but also applies to everyone else, teachers, parents, and others in the community. And likewise, all decisions, major decisions, um, uh, um, are made by involving these people in the community. And um, for instance, every three year, the school, the whole school community would come together or the wider community around the school would come together. And the visit is the ethos and vision to see if it is still relevant to this community and to see if it's relevant to the future that the community would like to travel towards. Um, Okay, so a few key features of the, Louis, the, the, the school that I was involved. The first of all, this is a very difficult to fathom, but uh, let's just imagine curriculum is not predetermined or imposed, but co-constructed, using your word, co-created can, through following children's curiosity and engaging children in dialogue. And so what, 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 what does the co-created curriculum mean. Um, so let's first and to try to understand what curriculum means, curriculum. Curriculum comes from the word Latin um, etymology, the, the root is um, the, like the French word courir, is to run, it's a cause of running, it's a pathway, it's a journey, it's a journey, but a curriculum is the resources around the journey so that you can actually have a more engaging journey together. So for the, for the school I'm involved, we call it the new school, at the start of each term, children come together, will decide what theme they would pr pursue could get throughout the term. And this theme derives from children's shared interest, which could range from um, sea seashells or slingshots to um, spaceships. 
So it arises from children's curiosity, and often one child's passion stimulates another child's um, uh, 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 enthusiasm until the entire class reach and reach an agreement to plunge more deeply into a particular topic. So this is a week-long process, and children as young as five years old contribute to that. Once the themes identified or decided, children will work at the individually of, um, in group to work on projects, and they they have learned to stick. This is the this is the relational part, relational strength. They have learned to stick to the collective decision, and also learn to discover other relevant interests. If the initial excitement wears off, we know what children like now. So what do teachers do? How do teachers make this process lively and possible? So within a relational ethic, clearly teachers cannot be the sage on the stage. They cannot be just teaching, imparting, or instructing. Co-created and emergent curriculum requires teachers to be facilitators of learning and the facilitators of relational processes that enrich both learning and relationing. So relational direction shifts from those vertical teachers at, at, at the authority and teachers are more powerful than the children to a, a horizontal, almost spontaneously, without adults relinquishing their responsibility for nurturing and for guiding, but with a willingness to join the relational flow as an equal partner with the children. Now, so when children's curiosity is at the foundation of learning and the end of day to day filled with endless questioning, investigating, inquiring. So the teacher's task is instead of transmission, knowledge or skills, whatever, teaching becomes cultivating the art of deep listening, inquiring, dialogue and caring. Is this a form of art because it's quite complex? For instance, how questions are created, are crafted, is really important to the quality of relationship that follow. The art of inquiring lies very much in posing questions that invites everyone into the conversation rather than excluding or limiting the conversation to a, a, a selected few. And they encourage multiple voices. And what it does is it reinforces the we. Um, yeah, so what are the, um, in addition, so we talk about pedagogy, we talk about curriculum. Perhaps we, we can talk about how um, the learning happens. So learning at, at the new school is characterized by uh, the collaboration of all kinds from project work to book clubs, to writing conferencing, to playground peer mediation. Lots of these terms make sense to those who work in schools. Well, let's just take project work as an example. You know, project work is carried out either individually, I mentioned, or as a team of two or three children. And they often takes up to six weeks to complete. That's why that relational resilience is required for children to to keep going. So learning that takes place during the project work um, is extremely rich. And each child is encouraged to express their imagination, curiosity, and ingenuity in completing the project. Although it seems like there is an end project, product, uh, i.e. the final project, but learning is truly open-ended. And, and, and a tr it's truly open-ended. It can involve partnership, across the learning communities and beyond. And for instance, um, I remember a child's music project um, and he, 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 he tried to write a song and they invite the whole school to help him record the, the chorus part, but he wanted to be in different languages. And he ended up with 33 languages in his song and everybody is, is part of that learning process. And someone just posted and say, well, universities in education and higher education can bear resemblance of this, of course. Yes. Um, OK, so I may just talk about a little bit about how relational ethics actually is a key to nurturing children's um, caring and responsibility, because this is really a, a key at this kind of open ended learning. Caring starts with a deep listening. Can you already talk about 
deep listening as kind of a it's proactive participation in each other's realities. From a relational ethic perspective, listening is a form of respect, a, a mutual affection and care. So listening can nurture students' voice, children's voice, student voice, which further give care to each other and to the world. But in terms of your idea, you say, how do they coordinate it exactly? Without they mutually caring, that gifting will not be well, will not happen because they can't be receiving. So this is this is as learning going happening. These kind of a process is uh, is ongoing, and children learn about responsibility equally from small things such as helping tidying up the classroom, serving snacks, cleaning, or, or uh, and the clearing after lunch and other duties. So in being responsible each other and making themselves responsible. So they learn about care and responsibility. From there, they can care for the wider world. I'm just going to mention one more um, about how relational ethics can apply to the whole community, and then I'll stop. Um, um, every Wednesday in the new school, in Wednesday afternoon, the teachers will take time, precious time, so needed for preparation, for meeting, for, 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 for sharing. But in the meantime, the school is buzzing with a variety of workshops run by local volunteers, parents, and others in the community. And these workshops are identified by children and they decide during, during their own termly forum, children have their own forums, decide what kind of workshop they want. And so um, these are workshops is also open to homeschooling children then further expanding the community at the learning community. And um, just to bring it together, just in this, in this kind of a, trying to illustrate how the relational ethic and how that relational coordination can happen in, in an education setting. So clearly a school that underpinned by relational ethic will value life, in this case, childhood, value learning and believe that both life and the learning should be unhurried, unpressurized, and well, free from fears, but fueled with love. Love that one receives, love that one gives. Love that makes a life and learning richer and more lively. Yeah, so um, I, I think probably that's, um, that's enough as illustration, Ken, that's back wonderful. to you. Yeah, wonderful. I think uh, it would be useful for me just now to underscore or to talk a little bit more about relational ethics because you mentioned it several times and I think it needs to be filled out a little bit to sort of see what we're about here. <clears throat> because we've got histories of, of various sorts of ethical visions of, of many, many kinds coming from many, many cultures. And one has to realize, at least from what I've said before, that all of those ethics are themselves co-creations. They're things that we have worked out to be intelligible within a condition, within a history, within a, within a, a, a people. The issue here, though, is that many of those ethics, in fact, <clears throat> are individualist. That is what I must do, what I must be responsible for. And secondly, they can conflict as we see in many cases about what is the ethical thing to do. We have now in the United States a, basically what has been declared a war by a religious sect against what is happening in terms of the liberal movement of society, which itself is an ethical position. So we got multiple ethics which have been co-created. Now the question is then what is it? How do we judge? And ask this, what is the process out of which those ethics came about in the first place? They came out of the process of co-creation. So that in fact, the very possibility of an ethic, the very possibility of doing good emerges from a process which itself should be an overarching ethic. That is the caring for the relational process. Now, as Shardo has pointed out, that relational process itself can go in many, many directions. 
it can be a generative process in which we learn from each other, in which there is growth, in which there is love, and so on, or it can be a degenerative process. Most wars in the world are based on relational process between countries, for example. Most fights that we have with each other are based on really, on, we know how to do those. We've seen them, we have traditions of them, they are like dances, as Sherato points out. We know how very well how to do them. But those kinds of processes, which are degenerative, lead to the end of the possibility of ethics itself. They lead to mutual annihilation or de decoupling or alienation in a way that the very process which can create ethics is, is, is obliterated. So then it seems here that what we're getting at is that the fundamental ethical proposal is care for the relational process in a way that it, it benefits. And ultimately not just us, two, three, four, the community, but we will expand that out perhaps later. But that's kind of the, the basis of the, the ethics of relational ethics. Um, I thought it might be useful to talk a little bit about um, the problems. I mean, all those are wonderful uh, examples you pointed out. I mean, you're, you, I, I watch you and you're so filled with enthusiasm and it's like it lights up the sky. Thing. Yeah, I want to do all of that. That's fantastic. We should share it everywhere. But everyone knows that with some exceptions, it's very difficult to mount those kinds of things. Even if you wanted to have an open classroom with multiple things going on, rich learning experiences in groups, um, going out into the community, sharing in the community, meeting, deciding, creating motivation, what we would love to do today, and so on, all that. Dialogic pedagogy, practice-based learning, and so on. The, the main problem, the main uh, impediment is testing because in the end of the day at least in most of our establishments you've got to measure up you've got to be under the quality control apparatus of the production system um, it, it doesn't matter how much wonderful stuff you may do and how much it benefits everybody but if it doesn't show up on testing if you can't test it you're not going to be inclined to do it very much because that student needs to be measured on standard tests, on the curriculum. They've got to show up as having mastered something. And it doesn't matter what else they do because it's the curriculum and that test which defines what is the good. So how much can you do? And it's kind of worse than that in some way because it what's happened over time is that the testing becomes kind of the goal of, of learning. So the student learns very rapidly to learn those things and only those things that are likely to show up on the test and be angry. You didn't tell us about that and it's on the test. Or I, if you haven't taught me well because I can't pass the test. So that and the teacher has to worry because the teacher will also be graded on the children's or the youth's testing scores. And the school will be graded on the test scores of the school. And that will be, that will be graded in terms of the nation or the, or the state. And ultimately it will become an international issue as to who has the highest test scores for various topics. And this is all backed up, at least in our country and in many others, by the higher education, because whether you get into higher education is dependent on the test scores. So what is school all about? It's about making high scores. Doesn't care about what, doesn't matter what you're interested in, what the curiosity, what potentials you have, the richness, it doesn't care, doesn't matter. It's like the test becomes the measure of education, becomes the, the goal of learning. In some ways, it's a total corruption of what education should be. Now, it, it's, 
it's not only the corruption, but in some ways I, I worry very much about students, and the well-being of students and all of this. Um, before the pandemic started, we had in the United States, which was an epidemic among youth in mental illness, anxiety, depression, uh, tension deficit, uh, bipolarity, and so on, just skyrocketing. Why? We don't know for sure, but one interesting thing that's happened is that testing has become increasingly, increasingly arduous and demanding. School dropouts. I can't do this. I'll just drop out. Or, look, I'm not scoring well. I'm no good. Or I'm just an average person. Or I have the best scores and I can look down on everybody else. Or I have the best scores, but I've got to keep working to make it happen. I've got, I've got to build my life around making those scores again and again. Now, what kind of... What kind of world is this for education? What kind of world have we created in our educational system when that's the feel we get? Now let me let me go back here also to this question of relational process. Because there are ways in which the process is scaffolded by the structure of the school. That is Take for you to, to sort of show what this is like. If I've got a, um, 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 a debate between political candidates, if I set up a debate, <clears throat> the structure of debate will assure virtually that I find problems in everything that my competitor says, and he or she would likewise for me. So we will continuously undermine each other, showing where each other is wrong and we're right. Now. That's the form, that's the dance, and it's scaffolded by political debates. And it doesn't matter if, in fact, we agree on 90% of things that we think are important. It doesn't matter if we, if we, as political candidates, have very similar ideas on A, B, C, and D, that we care about each other, that we love to work together, but you set up a political debate and we are, by virtue of the relational process, created as antagonists. So the question then becomes, what do we scaffold in the way of relationships in the current condition of, of, of testing? So imagine this, um, in the current condition of testing, I am as a student, my relationship to my other students is fundamentally competitive. That is, they are all competitors, and if I want to get the best scores, I better not make sure that if they don't know how much I'm studying, I may mislead them, I may mistur discourage them from studying, I must be anxious if they're doing well. So I've got a whole relationship that I'm building up there, not because I want to have that relationship, but because indeed the school structure of testing encourages that very kind of relationship. What kind of relationship do I have with my, with my teacher? That teacher becomes someone who's judging me. That judge, I have to be a little bit fearful, a little bit careful. Um, I can't be open. I've got to be distant. I've got to watch indeed what that judge wants. So there isn't an open relationship of friendship. It's an open, it's a relationship of, 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 of alienation. And as a teacher, what kind of relationship do I have with the student? My job is to get them to do something, score on that test. So I become a pusher. I'm constantly pushing them. I'm not encouraged to be friendly, to be sociable, unless it pays off the test. I'm not encouraged to treat them as a whole person, to listen sympathetically, to find out what they wish, what they want, because that gets in the way of what I really want, which is totally instrumental to get them to score well on the test, because indeed I am going to be scored on that basis too. So if they don't do well, I don't do well. And then who's judging me? My administration. So my administration becomes alienated from me. I can't be I have to show them certain things. I can't be open with them. I've got to have a relationship which 
benefits me on those tests, and so on. What about the student's relationship with parents? When testing is the major thing that you're interested in, is that student doing well? Is that student responsible? Is, that, is my son or daughter acceptable? Turns out to be a measurement of testing. You didn't do very well this semester. I think um, if you made that great. How could you do that? You're totally irresponsible. I'm going to take away your cell phone or whatever else for the, for the whole relationship with family, with parents, with caregivers becomes an alienated relationship. So all the way down the line in terms of progress, in terms of what Joe has been talking about, all these p potentials of pedagogy and curriculum and so on are blocked. And what we're doing in our form of evaluation becomes um, corrosive to education, to the human beings within it. Now that's pretty much what set us out to write this book on relational evaluation. And the idea there is, look, in the first place, yes, we do need evaluation. It's important to have to know how you're doing in many, many ways. How does this look? What does it do? What, what have I accomplished? Where could, I, where could I have been helpful? What would have been helpful? I mean, it helps to, if you're learning to ride a bicycle, to have an adult to help to prop you up and say, do this and do this. It helps if whatever you're learning to do, to have someone often to support that. Say, well, if you thought about that, maybe this would be a good idea. You know, you could improve on that and it would really be good. That kind of coaching, support, insight, wisdom, and so on is enormously helpful to the learning process. So we're not against evaluation. That's not the point. The problem is to find forms of evaluation which allow one to grow and develop, allow interest to, to sprout, to allow enhancement of, of engagement without that kind of punitive measurement-based orientation. So what we've tried to do is to develop a concept of relational evaluation, first of all, one which would again provide evaluation for growth, but secondly, which would, would encourage the very process of learning so that it doesn't become something I need to pass a test. And once I'm over it, it's gone. Most people can't pass the test that they had Indeed, the, the last semester before, because all that's out of their head now. What value is that? To encourage that continuous process of engagement within learning. <clears throat> and this is partly reflects back to the earlier concern with the fact that movement in society, movement in the global process is very rapid and complex and demands that continuous relearning, learn anew, engage, be excited and so on. So it's evaluation which helps the growth of learning, evaluation which would sustain the process of an interest, engagement in learning, and thirdly, going back to in some way, the ethic, uh, relational ethic, that would, in, it would enrich, enhance the process of relationship itself, out of which students would become in valuing that process realizing its potential, realizing the ways in which they can contribute to it. So what would that look like? How could we enhance, how could we develop, how could we generate that form of evaluation and share it so that it becomes a major part of the educational process? So let me uh, go back to you, Chateau, and pick that up. Um, yes. Um... But lots to lots to um, consider, and I was just watching the um, the chats, and um, people are really interested in in practice what can happen. Well, um, first of all, you may have noticed that we intentionally chose the term evaluation as opposed to other terms such as assessment. Even there are terms like formative assessment, and and we also didn't use measurement of course or appraisal these terms they because these latter terms tend to carry a strong connotation of um somehow independent objective judgment 
on something. And, 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 and someone just said, Cindy just said, it's looking at the past experience. There's a, something happened in the past and you make a judgment of it. And, but also it implies that education can only achieve through hierarchy, someone who's, who would know better, some authority and so on. So that means students were always at the bottom. Yeah. Um, what I can describe, let's just go back to the, to the concept um, of relational orientation to educational evaluation. It's really characterized by two defining features. As we said in this book, and the first is to regard evaluation as a process of valuing. That by emphasizing evaluation, you think evaluation already had the word value in it, by emphasizing evaluation as a process of appreciating the values in the activities of teaching and learning, in the experience, in our, our kind of co-flourishing, our well-being together, that shifts the way we look at education altogether, just by shifting the word and defining the word differently. So in doing so, evaluation can replace the emphasis on students' deficiency, but with a focus on what can say potentiality, possibility, and opportunity for well-being. Maybe even we can use the word well-becoming. So valuing, valuing, in fact, um, you think about it, is a form of love. Value and help of, helps affirm students' intrinsic worth wellness as persons and also recognize that their well-being is important, their well-becoming is important, and therefore support them to develop their strength, but also fostering hope and engagement. Now, the other defining feature we make, we may say that we need to use the word evaluation. We conceive the evaluation as a form of inquiry but not those kind of stringent inquiry, but co-inquiry, co-inquiring. It's a shared relational process whereby students and teachers, maybe administrators and families and other people in the community collaboratively inquire into the meaningfulness of educative processes, activities and experience as a form of co-inquiry students and teachers into a dialogic exploration as a past partners. So you often hear project evaluation up there and, and NGOs work, they use the word participatory evaluation. This can be one, one, of, uh, one form of describing that. So one is uh, valuing, the other one is co-inquiring, both underpinned by you matter, what you experience matter. What you're going through matters for me and I care about it. And that way is very different from the, 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 the normal sort of testing base and, and, gra and, and grading base because it's full of judgment, demoralizing often. So in their current form, summative practice, we're just not able to do that. It serves the purpose, like Ken already said, surveillance, control, gatekeeping, quality assurance. Again, going back to that system production. Now, by contrast, this formative and relational orientation to evaluation really engages uh, students or young people and teachers. They all add active participant in learning and sense making. Now, so as Ken said, relational evaluation serves three purposes enhance learning process, sustain our learning engagement. And that, that point is really important. Often you think about the exams. After exams, you, you, you forget 90% of, of this. And, 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 um, and after the exam, you think, oh, there's, there's no need to, to continue. It's a termination. Whereas this kind of evaluation will in, in, enhance that continuity, sustain that enthusiasm for learning. And of course, can the third point can said is to enrich that in regenerative relational process at core of, of, of all that we needed for, for, for now, for future, of those kind of a relational flourishing with all that is. Now, the next question is, Ken, probably you would ask, how do we do that? How do we do that in schools? And I think when we did this, um, when we did research for, for writing this book, 
we suddenly realize, well, there are lots of, at a systemic level, there's no, very few countries actually fully abolish um, testing and grading, apart from New Zealand. New Zealand is the only country in 2018 that passed a, 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 a bill to say that from that moment, they're going to abolish standardized, standardized testing. But what happened is when you abolish that, all the educators begin to come into a, 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 a debate. What do we do now? We're so used to this way of uh, ascertain where the students are, where we are, where the schools are, where the teachers are. But now you, you take off that that uh, a, a, a measurement, what do we do? Where do you do now? So what do we do? Where do we go? Um, but otherwise, at systemic level, very few countries have, have reached that point. On the other hand, at the grassroots level, in the classroom, we packed a book with full of active examples of what, 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 what happens in the classroom. And um, project-based learning, project investigation, dialogue reflection, deliberation on learning, collaborative feedback, appreciative inquiry. There's so much. Well, the time is limit, limited. So what I would do, Ken, if you agree, I would just go through um, probably a couple of um, examples. And I've, I've seen some of our British colleagues um, in, in the audience who have already passed um, um, posted on the chat. In, in the UK, in primary school, we had something called a learning review meetings. This has started um, a few years back um, through the, this movement of learning without, without um, learning with no borders or learning with, with no limit, a movement. And what they do is they let the child to be the host of learning review meeting. And she would reflect in front of parents, teachers, and maybe even, even the, 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 the school principal. Uh, while she presents her learning journeys, she invites feedback from the adults on her progress. And these are formative feedback in, intended to nurture her growth and development. And then so that they can help her identify further direction for her learning. The child, the young person is actually the, 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 the competent and confident host of such review meeting. So that's at primary level. And the secondary level, I've just, um, yeah, so let me just uh, it, choose one example. And this has happened with lots of self-managed learning groups. And this has been introduced in lots of schools. And that is using learning agreement as a, a, a kind of a framework to hold this whole to hold this whole process of of uh, relational evaluation so learning agreement is agreed upon with a group of other young people facilitated by the teacher so as they agree on their each person's learning objectives and their trajectories and their journeys this group forms like almost like an evaluation committee they, they look at each other's progress, they provide feedback, they talk about it, they explore possibilities. So learning is not just a, 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 um, 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 an isolated individual event, it becomes the we, our learning journey, our process together, and so on. So that's a secondary. I may also say um, something about um, I may say something about um, 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 teachers evaluation. Normally teachers kind of it's a work and as, as a, a teacher's work is always as being appraised. And in some extreme situations, teachers work is, is connected to their pay rise, how much they get, whether they can get pay, pay rise. And what they tend to use for teachers appraisal, of course, is students grades and scores. And you can see one is a teacher under huge pressure. Two is teachers are forced to teach to the test. And with a relational practice in, in, in the classroom. So that can be um, what you do, what, what tends to happen is teacher can go through things like co-inquiry that we talk about and, and a mutual reflection. 
And after the class, the teacher can provide each other with that feedback and dialogue. And this is all part of their professional learning, professional development, not rather than seeing as a praise of you as an individual, how well do it. When you see this uh, evaluation is a value in your profession, value your own growth. Let's inquire into it and see what you can become. What, how can you blossom as an educator? So practice, for instance, in, 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 in uh, relationally enriching um, 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 sort of an evaluative practice include some of the probably you know very well, peer evaluation, team teaching, peer mentoring, and and peer coaching, co-inquiry, but also it's very much, and, and, and we left out, but in the 70s it started this action-based action research cycle, using action research as a framework to reflect and on our, our teaching practice and improve our teaching. So good teaching really embraced community where these multitudes of relationships played out dynamically and lived out in the classroom and beyond. The same is true with the evaluation of teaching, which is in part an inquiry into and a, reflect and, and a reflection on these mirrors of relationship and how the unfolding lives of the teachers and the students within the community can become part of that flourishing agenda. So if just, just imagine this, the rippling effect can be really far reaching. And finally, I probably will, it's 1717, I will just touch upon how schools can be um, evaluated. And those of you in the audience in the UK, you know, for schools, when the Ofsted arrive, it's like, it's like a whole week of hell. And in fact, we have been working with, I don't know whether our colleagues are here in this, in this um, Zoom um, um, a meeting, but um, and in, in London, there is a group of young people that are actually discussing how to develop a relational alternative to Ofsted, which is a school inspection. When the inspector call, the community shudder. So how do we actually embed that relational process in evaluating schools? And what are the what are the practice? Those of you interested, if you really look, would like to look at New Zealand's process. Now, we're just giving an example in our own school. What we tend to have is um, 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 uh, instead of school inspection, we ins invite all stakeholders in this is a whole school review. We invite all stakeholders in the community to participate in a collective reflection on the community's progress and envision together how to advance the aims of education and how to support students' learning and well-being. And practices such as combining questionnaires, interviews, focus group dialogue, whole community inquiry, this can really inspire communities' curiosity about these processes and potentials and the needs for change. Now, this is a, a, a in this process, a sense of... Um, you may call it a collective responsibility is invited. And so there's more we could talk about in terms of practice, but the, the, the bottom line is at the, at, at, at the grassroots level in the classroom, teachers are already, I think teachers are the most, most creative, most imaginative people in the world and they will resist. That's what Professor Jim Garrison always wants to advocate action, action at 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 at, bot, at, at the um, 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 grassroots level. Um, Ken, so um, I think we yeah. are action. coming towards uh, yeah. towards. We probably have about ten minutes or or, or less than ten minutes, five minutes even, just yeah. to wrap this up. How would you like to do that? Well, I'd like to talk a little bit about action. <laughs> Because always um, the question is, all right, we all want to do this. Teachers would love it. Students would love it. Parents would love it and so on. But how are we going to do this? And I have no really answers to that. Now, that requires some collective attention, too. We can't all be New Zealand, even though I'd, I'd like to think so. My tendency right now is to say, well, let's look at at cases, schools in which things would really have happened that, that are exemplary, where school systems which really seem to work 
and work from the grassroots up. I mean, there is a lot of sort of national attention in a number of countries uh, to testing and in schools. What are we going to do with schools now in the current climate? There's also concern within universities about testing. There's also concern with schools about what the tests mean in the time of COVID. So the dialogues are there in terms of policy making. But in the end, I think really some excellent school systems would be just the, the kind of impressive. I think here, for example, of uh, High Tech High in California, where it's been people come from all over the world just to see what High Tech High is doing and the way in which it engages students. The, the concern not with tests, but with, with collaborative work on various projects. I like very much um, the work of the Youth Investing or Malin School in Norway, in which they have taken a school for dropouts, all right, the people who didn't, could not continue in education, and have generated a system which is built around many of the ideas that we're talking about here today, which is now other parts of the country want to do that. So they've picked up, and that one school has now become eight schools, and now it's got the attention of the national government. So there will, it will be now part of the national concern about, well, this shouldn't be just for dropouts, perhaps. Perhaps some of these ideas could be, could be made more general. The other thing I wanted to talk about, and not know, maybe you could finish off with this, because I know you have a lot to say, um, because what we've done very much here is concentrate on what's going on in the school as if that were the universe. And this, the relational ethic would suggest that you don't want to start with that, stop with that community. You want to build out from the school. You want to build out locally. You want to build out into the community. You want to build out ultimately globally. So that school system should be connected with schools everywhere so education becomes that which unites us across boundaries of various sorts so it becomes fully a process of sharing growth um, collaboration and so on um, there are ways to do that there are means of doing it but i think that really demands a, a, a lot of attention how can we make this a far more general orientation than simply talking about um, uh, public education. Yeah. Um, Kathleen just said that net is not about the students and um, but it's about the system. Um, I think we have a, a few minutes left. I would want to, what I want to do is um, having been um, um, a keen participant of this um, humanity rising for over a year and I've been listening to the um, different kinds of discourse and different and people sharing different projects and concerns, I want to take it to a slightly bigger picture because we are at the moment working at UNESCO with UNESCO in developing an initiative that aims at educational transformation but also collective healing. So why why I want to take the bigger picture? Okay, so here's. Here's some just random thoughts, but I invite the community to, 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 to participate. Well, recently um, it had came to our awareness that humanity, humans, are only part of a very, very long, deep history that is not simply our own and which we share with other beings on the planet. And not such a deep history cannot really be explained purely from a human perspective. Like all other beings on this planet, humans born within the ecosystem, and we, we, we participate in the process, we co-flourish with all that is. And in other words, human life is the only part of the deep history, uh, mutually constituted, fully integrated, and interdependent. And I think these are the points that humanity rising has repeated a lot of times. What that means, what it means here, we're looking at the systems. And it's not just about the education system, it's about something bigger than that. It means that humans cannot regard ourselves to be occupying a very special status in this deep history. Other beings exist alongside us, and they are that and, and rather than not as opposed to us. That is to say, we are beings among beings, 
who populate this planet. And each, um, each of the beings with that are all there, own specific capacities and potentials. And other beings, I don't know whether you've seen that film, My Oct Octopus Friend, other beings are not there to be instrumentalized, they're exploited for human interest. Humans are not just providing ourselves this power over other beings, privilege our self-interest, or making our needs and the striving at the core of all concerns. So the world does not exist in reference to humans, but the world and all its beings, including humans, are should be valued in their own right. Now, so the reason I want to mention this is because such understanding gave rise to two significant points. Point one is it's time to decenter the human. By adding humans to self-aggrandizing uh, 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 approach that regards ourselves at the center of the planet's ecosystem, that doesn't work. But then decentering means to challenge the hierarchy of power, status, priorities, and, and so on. And Kav had did a beautiful, beautiful uh, um, a session on, 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 on the racism and so on. You know, there, from, from micro level, we have hierarchies of power in schools, in societies, but in the bigger context, we still have hierarchy of power, status and priorities. But these, by decentering, we can perceive our needs and the well-being to be situated within the harmonious and the co-flourishing of all other beings on earth. So it's time that we shifted from human's ambition of domination, either mutual domination or domination of the earth. To be human is to share earth's resources with other subjects within the ecosystem. So we must carry on living with the other humans and other beings with no exclusion. So that's one, to decenter the human. What the other part is, I think it's important is to recenter the human at the same time. Not to put human at the center of power and domination, but to recognize that the relational nature of our being and accept our infinite, infinite, infinite responsibilities for each other, but with no desire for reciprocity. We have a responsibility. We don't need reciprocity in that, on that account. They include in particular, our love, our guardianship, our custodianship towards the whole planetary, you call it planetary integrity. So now, by decentered in human, we also reach an understanding that regeneration cannot be something that we manage, do, control, we act. Regeneration can only be invited by co-creating co-creating the conditions within which regeneration and the healing takes place. Life regenerates life, heals life, heals life. Living systems regenerate, regenerate and heal, heal living systems as long as the conditions are, conditions are right. Now, recentering the human, we can see that education is in part that condition for regeneration. That's why we started the whole session. It is a site to build, um, <clears throat> build on humans' um, um, epist epistemic diversity, our culture strength, raising our own awareness of that interconnectedness, enriching our caring, deepening our love and the valuing, and sustain those regenerative bonds at multiple level. Yeah. So um, just to close, and I think we ran out of time. Uh, uh, and uh, I wanted to um, mention, uh, Sherto, that um, you and I will be teaching this course for the ubiquity, and also the Taos Institute will be doing an online international conference uh, open to all in November, and we can distribute more information about that too. Yeah, yeah. Well, just to um, thank you, and I think Jim comes here, and Jim just have I just want to, I, I'm on a, on a trail of thought. Sorry, I can't stop. Um, I, I wanted to say that the reason we must focus on regeneration, I mean, Jim, this is your vision. Well, I think it's already been highlighted at the beginning of the session is that currently there is a brutality, a viciousness and the violence of our, our systems. 
and, and practices, including both economic and education systems and practice, have resulted in this um, a host of words, rapture, deeply, depletion, brokenness, severance, degradation, and so on and so forth. And it's corrupting our life system and the life, the sacred nature of life itself. So more importantly, it resulted in a, an alienation of ourselves from ourselves. And then, and Jim, you started and saying, we have to return ourselves. We are the ones we've been waiting for. So, um, um, so hence to move forward towards regeneration, we almost like need education with, 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 with a soul. And um, so it's, it's therefore towards ourselves, i.e. towards the, commu- the we, towards the communities, the human communities, nature, nature communities, and the communities of the spirits that we now must turn, building on our knowledge, building our strength, memories, narratives, and myths, and collective wisdoms. And um, so I think here lies the, and Jim, you call it the radical collaboration, but I want to say is here lies the radical hospitality, embracing, and in the word of Ashil Mbambi, who was African a philosopher, everyone and everything on the planet and their well-being and the wellness with absolute goodwill. And on that basis, <clears throat> engendering a sense of mutual belongingness. Finished. That's the end of <laughs> my, my, my stream of thought, sorry. <laughs> uh, Cherteau Gill, you are sublime. You are sublime. You have encapsulated in the last few minutes in your final statement, I think the essence of the ethos of regeneration and education. I just want to acknowledge that and thank you for that. And Kenneth, uh, the depth of your caring about learning is just palpable. It's just, uh, I feel inspired. I mean, uh, everyone, we should all take in, we've heard probably the best analysis of the problems of education and the most expansive vision of what education can and should be uh, in our time that I think we've ever had, certainly on Humanity Rising. So I want to salute both of you for uh, not only the extraordinary articulateness with which you crafted your language, but the depth of your heartfulness as you carry this deep empathy for all being uh, in a very embodied way, it's it's uh, it's it's deeply inspiring to me. I've been just sitting here in awe uh, at uh, what you've laid out over the last uh, hour or so, and uh, I just wanted to reiterate what uh, what Ken was saying. Um, uh, uh, Ken and and Chertow have developed a course. Uh, that you'll see listed on uh, uh, educational regeneration, which we've now included in our new masters in regenerative action. Uh, Because one of the things that we are doing as a result of humanity rising and everything that's gone on over the last year has really been subsumed into the meta thematic of regeneration, because that is really the only choice left for humanity at a moment when scientists are telling us we've run out of time, uh, is to regenerate uh, humanity uh, and regenerate the larger uh, ecofield. And as Chertow uh, uh, put it so mythopoetically, learning in the future has to embody uh, the human, but the human within the context of the larger ecosystem of all sentient life. Uh, And one of the uh, things that I would just add to underscore uh, this is a point that has also been raised. Uh, If we are nature, this conversation today has been nature speaking with nature, earth with earth, we are the environment. Then one of the challenges of learning uh, is interspecies communication. 
how do we start embedding in our educational system learning how to talk with other species we learn greek we learn chinese we learn french we learn swahili we we learn other human languages just imagine if world education uh, was centered on learning how to talk with the bees how to talk with the eagles how to talk with the trees how to talk with the flowers. Just imagine the explosion in human identity, let alone consciousness, if we really took in that we are just one strand in the larger web of life, all of which is intelligent, compassionate, caring, and capable of communication. Uh, so that's that's uh, an aspect, and I also want to uh, acknowledge that um, uh, uh, Ken is bringing the Taos Institute into our Global Acc Accreditation Council. Uh, Cherteau uh, sits on the supervisory board because what we've heard today, everyone, uh, is what education needs to be, and a part of our challenge in the world right now is that the current accreditation systems are keeping education bound to the past. And what we need is, a, is a, an accreditation system that liberates education so that it can embrace what uh, Ken and Chateau are speaking so passionately about. Uh, and we invite all of you uh, to go uh, on the website and look up the Global Accreditation Council, uh, org. It's based in The Hague. Uh, it's being uh, established uh, by Ubiquity University and the University of International Cooperation in Costa Rica, Earth University uh, in India, uh, Fintorn College, and a range of uh, NGOs, because some of the most profound and important learning content right now is not coming from the schools, because they're imprisoned. It's coming from the non-government organizations who are free to develop content. And that's one reason why Ubiquity University and its very design encourages our students to look beyond Ubiquity, to look beyond the academic sector and to go out and learn from all the available opportunities for learning, uh, both experientially, but also in terms of the content that's being developed uh, by the non-governmental uh, uh, sector. So we're literally in an explosion of a revolution in education. And what you've heard uh, is the message from two of the, uh, the prophets uh, and two of the uh, leaders uh, in this uh, fundamental transformation. Uh, so uh, Ken Gergen, uh, Sherto Gill, uh, we salute you for everything that you're doing, because education in the end is the sacred trust that each generation has to those yet unborn. How do we curate the enormous compendium of human knowledge built over hundreds of thousands of years and even more deeply into the evolutionary past? How do we condense that down in such a way that the next generation that comes out of our loins is prepared for the future that we're also bequeathing to them. That's the sacred trust of education and learning. And we've heard today an aspirational vision of what it could be. So thank you. Thank you very, very much. You're very welcome. And then, on uh, tomorrow, everyone, same time, same station, we're going to be hearing from Jill Purse. She's a master of sound, uh, overtone chanting, and she's going to be speaking to us and demonstrating through sound, the healing power of sound. So that's tomorrow on Humanity Rising. Uh, you're all welcome uh, to uh, join our after session chat. Uh, the link has been put in the uh, chat box. I uh, want to also encourage everyone to sign up. Uh, for our course in regenerative 
Economics with Kate Rayworth on Donut Economics. That's the foundational course uh, for our MRA, our Masters in Regenerative Action that, that uh, Ken and Chertoe's course uh, on uh, educational regeneration is now a part. Um, and also want to encourage those of you who remember the lecture uh, from Friday uh, to the uh, course on dialectica. I put the link in the chat uh, earlier on. So there's many opportunities for learning in and through Humanity Rising uh, and Ubiquity University. Uh, and I thank everyone. Uh, see you tomorrow. Uh, same time, same station uh, here on Humanity Rising. Bye for now. Thank you.